Hello, I'm Henry, and I read a book. I read this book, Flannels of the Deep by Ricky Gervais and illustrated by Rob Steen, and I would like to talk about it, please. I'm not sure if this is news to anyone, but uh, Ricky Gervais is an atheist. He doesn't bring it up all that much, so I felt I should. No, but seriously though, I mentioned in my first video that while he didn't invent vocal atheism, he is certainly one of the reasons it has hit the mainstream so hard. He's one of the reasons you see atheism videos pop up on your Instagram reels, one of the reasons you see atheists show up on Joe Rogan. He's a very well-known and well-respected celebrity, and now he's saying all these well-spoken and well-reasoned things about God not being real. Obviously, people are going to resonate with that. Though when I say well-reasoned and well-spoken things about God not being real, we should probably keep in mind that he didn't always throw a nine dart up. The invention of lying is not a well-spoken, well-reasoned thing about God not being real. It is, frankly, quite really not good with, as I said in the previous video, an excellent premise executed about as poorly as possible. I would consider Flannimals of the Deep a parallel to the invention of lying. But where the invention of lying is a self-indulgent blamange of a movie that collapses in on itself in the soggiest, soupiest way possible, Flannels of the Deep is brilliant. It is a very real attempt at some evolutionary biology whilst remaining thoroughly tongue-in-cheek the whole way through. It's not well spoken, as I think I've made very clear now, that the Flannimal series and the world therein is utter nonsense, but it is absolutely well reasoned. Its allegory, its equivalents, its analogues, its implications, its thoughts are all on point. Maybe a little too on point in places, but that doesn't stop them being on point. Just for a quick refresher though, flannels are a group of nonsense fictional creatures living in their own fictional nonsense world. We've gone through two of the books so far, looking at the survivability of each flannel, the aspects and development of their world, and the first class speculative biology on the part of Ricky Gervais and Rob Steen. This book though, as I alluded to earlier, takes a turn toward the evolutionary and the existential, the sceptical and the spiritual. Chapter one is called In the Beginning, and the first line of the book is In the Beginning There Was Nothing. That should tell you all you need about the angle this book is taking. Now, the previous book, More Flanimals, did dip its toes into some evolutionary biology, but in this book it is front and center and explored in depth. We are told that flanimal life is exclusive to one planet and that it started in the water. With a surprising bit of continuity from the previous book when we are reintroduced to the first flanimal life Splawn. I say surprising bit of continuity because this is weird man Ricky Gervais we're talking about here. It wouldn't shock me if he just did away with everything he's done up to this point and made up some new stuff because it would be funny, or if he just forgot. But no, that doesn't happen. Instead, he genuinely explores the concept of Splawn. There are variations of this primitive life, the first being Mulgi, a cross between mud and light. We hear that some Mulgi were washed onto land and they became the terrestrial flanimals that we've seen so far, though the majority of the Mulgi remained in the water and became the Cludge. And from here, things branched off all over the place, with examples here becoming a Sploon, a Flunt, an Iggle, and finally a Biff Uddler, or a Whittle, a Wumpf, and then a Spluff, or directly becoming a Scrundler. What's interesting about these examples in particular is that the Iggle and the Biff Uddler are specifically labelled as Fleptiles, and the Whittle and the Scrudler are labelled as multiprods. These are designations slash subsets that we haven't come across yet, reinforcing the concept of branched evolution coming from a singular form of life. These creatures are different from each other, so different that they require separate delineations, but they all come from the same thing. This is evolutionary biology in a nutshell. We also get descriptions of behaviour of some of the flanimals that appear earlier in these evolutionary trees, confirming that they exist simultaneously with the flanimals at the end of the tree, addressing the common counter-evolution question if we evolve from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? It's just how it works. The better adapted evolved, the adequately adapted stay the same, the poorly adapted died. It's just how it works. But if that's too much of a subtle shot at evolution doubters for you, allow me to read this next bit verbatim. A strange story went around. The flannels hadn't evolved, but were made in no time at all by one creature named Grob, who had never been seen, but was everywhere. Yes, it doesn't make any sense, does it? Only the most primitive and stupid flanimals believed this. The clever ones knew that such a creature was impossible. You've seen how diverse the flanimal kingdom is, how amazing life on the plant is. How could anyone create all of this by design, by themselves? Who could have such an imagination? They wouldn't just have to be an artist and scientific genius. Why, they would have to be godlike. They would deserve to be worshipped. You'd have to buy their book at least. But no, there is only one explanation for it. All life slowly evolved and changed over billions of years. Glorious. A shot at religion and a hilarious meta-commentary all in one. Grob, 
Sounds like God, also maybe a combo of the G from Gervais, and Rob, the guy who illustrated the book. This is the kind of thing Invention of Lying wishes it was. But it isn't just flanimals we get in this book, we get Flants, the other kingdom of life. Basically just plants if that name wasn't obvious enough for you. But with eyes they don't need. They're said to be very similar to flanimals, with cellular structures and the capacity to grow, reproduce and die. But they get their energy from light and mud and water instead of food. So not only has Ricky Gervais tackled the evolution of animals, he's also branching out into plants. Huh. <laughs> Branch. There is so much ground being covered here. And then we hit chapter three, the Flanosaurs, where we explore the ancient Flanimal world and, citing fossil evidence, find out exactly how Flanimals evolve via changing environment, adaptation, and behavior. We see that there used to be some flying Flanimals and we get some solid timelines for the evolution of the Grundit and the Clunjambler specifically, showing us that Flanimal evolution takes place over the course of hundreds of millions of years. As I said, Evolution is front and center in this book, and the parallels to our own world are there for the whole world to see. It's almost like with his platform, Ricky Gervais feels like he has a duty to spell this stuff out for people who don't believe it. And I'd argue that this book, with its nonsense gobbledygook and its fun illustrations, is actually a better way to get the concepts of evolution across than some slightly mean-spirited stand-up. This book doesn't just expand on the detail and the delivery of evolutionary biology though, it also adds a whole new lot of flanimals. In the last two videos, on top of looking at all the themes and creativity being explored, we've also been going through each flanimal individually and deciding whether each of them could actually survive, or if they're just so nonsense they could not function. We did this by assigning each of them a tier, those tiers being yes, they would survive, maybe they could survive, and no, they would not survive. The previous totals were 22 yeses, 5 maybes, and 15 noes. So with a whole bunch of new flanimals, let's add to those totals. The Mulon, the most intelligent species on the flanimal planet, specifically stated to evolve to fit its needs and its environment. This is the closest thing to a human, I'd say. So, yes, the Groy, one of the classic nonsense entries, but like most nonsense entries, nothing stating that it wouldn't survive. Yes, Sleeve, we find out later this is basically a cow, or at least some form of domesticated animal. Yes, the Mulf, an aggressive flanimal that just swims and eats and kills. I might give this a maybe just in case it ran into the Squat, the previously established hardest flanimal of all that could kill anything it comes across. But we're in the sea now, remember? No Squats in the sea. So yes, the Sproy, another nonsense entry. The Sproy is like a giant spry flager without the clongs. It more than makes up for the lack of clongs with its overdeveloped noisels. It uses these to froob and nung about viciously. Nothing here hampering its survivability. Yes, the plump. Similar to some of the flanimals we've covered previously in that it has a terrible defense mechanism. However, where the previous few would be fine if they just weren't actually attacked, the plump's defense mechanism actively hurts it, burning its own eyes off. So, no. The hungloid, its only sin is being ugly. Yes, the Clug Snipe, another revolting one, but this one is specifically stated to be full of love and wanting to do good. So yes, the Rock Strambler is wrong, but there is nothing anyone can do about it. That sounds like a great defense mechanism to me. Yes, the Spry Flagger, mentioned in the Spry description, which is actually quite a rare thing, a, a flanimal mentioned in one part of the book actually showing up in another part of the book. Where the Spry was a yes though, the Spry Flagger is a no. It confuses its prey, but then leaves without eating them, so never eats. The Splug, a maybe, because it has a very strange case of self-loathing in that it naturally inspires hatred in everyone it comes across, but it hates itself even more. I'm, I'm just not sure how that would function. The Blamp, born slow and old, but everyone likes it for sentimental and legal reasons. Yes, the Ungler Water Mungler, the cover athlete related to the Mung Ungler from the previous book. That one was a yes, but this one is a no because its udders float holding its head underwater, and so it just drowns. We now get some collective entries, which is new to this book, similar to the Fleptiles and Multiprods from earlier. The Lazarbranks, including the Grelch, the Bronk, and the Crobbler. Primitive and unsculled, but they still get by. Yes, the Skeliosts. They live alone because they've got this self-imposed paradigm of beauty, not knowing that they are very ugly themselves. Without going near anyone else, this subset would fail. No. The Snish, unincriminating nonsense equals a yes. The Scronox, make a nasty scream, but doesn't mean they wouldn't survive. Yes, the Brones, they snap, doesn't mean they wouldn't survive. Yes, the Scrolls, 
some of the scariest looking flanimals. And based on this joke of the progressively uglier creatures in this subgroup section are maybe the worst looking of all flanimals, doesn't mean they wouldn't survive. Yes, and that's all the new flanimals in this book. So let's total that up. 14 yeses, one maybe, and four noes. Bringing our totals up to 36 yeses, six maybes, and 19 noes. Those yeses are really piling up. So far, 59% of all flanimals would survive. Despite this being a nonsense comedy book not to be taken seriously at all, when you do take it seriously, you will find a significant amount of sense within the nonsense. On top of keeping track of the survivability of the flanimals, we've also been jotting down every instance of the flanimal world being expanded. And boy, does this book do that. In its nature of delving deep into the evolution of the flanimals, aspects of the wider world are mentioned, built upon, and outright shown. There are so many little nuggets here and there that it would be actually quite boring if I just sat here and listed them all out. So I'll focus more on the bigger, more substantial things. The first thing regarding the world is the biggest thing regarding the world the world. We get what the world looks like from space. A blue and green planet not unlike Earth. And confirmation that I mentioned earlier that flanimals only exist on this one planet. This depiction of the world sets the tone for the rest of the world building in the book. In the depictions. We physically see a whole lot more of the world here. Forests and the quirks therein. The seabed and the quirks therein. Deserts and shorelines of the ancient past. And this. Just look at this. A double page spread of gloriousness. Rob Steen, you have outdone yourself, sir. There are plants and mountains and rocks and water and sand and holes. There is so much going on here, including my boy, the Swog Monglet. I think what we can say with all these images of the Flanimal world is that it is actually very similar to Earth. The biomes, the climate, the geography, it's all really similar. Obviously, it's full of madness. Plants with eyes they don't need and animals that do absolutely nothing then die. But that aside, the Flanimal animal world at this point, with all its evolution and its environments, can be seen as somewhat of a funhouse mirror reflection of our own. Also, I think as far as expansion of the world goes, we might have reached critical mass here. I genuinely don't think we need to add to it. What we can do is explore how flanimal behaviour affects the world. The example specific to this book is agriculture. We see that the groy are somewhat higher on the intelligence development scale, as they farm and tend to sleep. This is huge, as the domestic of animals and organized agriculture is one of the massive steps that humanity took in its development. I wouldn't be surprised if the flanimal world starts becoming more modern and industrialized just like our own, as long as some kind of apocalyptic event doesn't happen. Now to just give my quick thoughts on the book. As a follow-up to more flanimals goes, I don't think this could be any better. I said that about more flanimals as a follow-up to flanimals, but it still tracks here. The expansion of the world and the creatures is just so natural and well-timed. We're learning about these aquatic creatures now because we've done all the stuff on the land. We're learning about flanimal evolution in depth now because we've flirted with it before and this fictional life needs to have come from somewhere. It's all nonsense, it's all fun, it's all dark, it's all bleak, it's all hilarious. The creature designs step up big time too, becoming more intricate and detailed by necessity here if we're talking about environmental adaptation and the like. And yet somehow this book is still short and sweet. You could finish it in an afternoon and that afternoon would be better for it. To emphasize just how dedicated this book is to explore exploring flanimal evolution, I'd just like to present chapter four, the Mulons. It is essentially a case study on the Mulon flanimal specifically. And it is no joke. Citing fossil evidence, we are told and shown how its ancestor, the Plugons, behaved and lived. How they developed through their intelligence, how their evolutionary lines split and became the Mulon and the Blunging, how the Mulons eventually became creatures of land and sea. We're even given figures scientific figures showing how the Mulon use pack mentality to avoid predators. This is the kind of thing you'd get in a proper academic study. And if you eliminate all the nonsense words and brilliantly dark humour, the contents is something you'd also get in an academic study. So while Flannels of the Deep could be seen as just another petty Ricky Gervais shot at religion, I would say it's a whole lot more than that. Hello, hello, hello. Thanks a lot for getting to the end of the video. Like and subscribe and all that. Sorry. If I'm a little bit tense and distracted, the NLD is happening just off camera and people are saying that Spurs actually have a chance of winning this one, which of course means they will lose horribly.